from the 2013 Spring Roundup. Wally Cognon, to play the game, bring a team. NEPA does not say shut down logging, shut down timber, shut down egg, shut down cows, shut down all of it. NEPA says the government recognizes an obligation for the broadest range of beneficial uses possible and we seek to preserve important historic, cultural, and natural aspects of our national heritage. Agriculture is a national heritage. In Montana, it's not only that. In Montana, there was a constitutional requirement in the state's constitution that the legislature shall create a Department of Livestock and a Department of Agriculture to accomplish exactly those things. So it's not only a question of it's important and the National Environmental Policy Act says it is, it's also a function of it's a constitutional obligation in the state to your north. And Wyoming is just as progressive. Great trivia question, what was the first state to give women the vote? Wyoming. What was the second, six days later? Montana. What was the first state to give Native American citizenship? Montana. Wyoming was fifth. Talk about a bunch of redneck conservatives that are so bad. Why did those rednecks give women the right to vote first, citizenship to Native Americans, etc., and acknowledge in Montana what Rachel Carson said in 1963? It's a very important thing to have a right to a healthful environment. Silent Spring, Rachel Carson, 1964, and in Montana, it is a constitutional right to a clean and healthful environment. To preserve custom, culture, heritage, and history is the critical part of the National Environmental Policy Act and a multitude of beneficial uses. The problem is, for the last 30 years, agriculture has not shown up for the ball game. It's a game, and if you're going to play, bring a team. And if you think I'm kidding, go watch your high school team play tomorrow night, wherever you're from, and don't have your team show up and see what the score with the other team is. It's a lot of fun when you go swoosh, 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 and the score is like 100 to nothing because a team no showed. It's that simple. So this is an exercise basically and how do you go about changing what that whole thing looks like? So if you can first give everybody a copy of this, that would be grand. So this is an outline that was done for the county commissioners of a number of states titled, To Play the Game, You Have to Bring a Team. And while Montana no longer calls them a resource use plan or a comprehensive plan, Montana calls a plan a growth policy. And although this is Wyoming, the reason I left you the language in here about the history of comprehensive plans, what you're going to see when I read you the federal rules is that matters incredibly if you have a plan. It makes a huge difference in the whole gig. So the first page defines Montana's growth policies about communities had a comprehensive plan by 1976. Everyone had to have a sewage treatment plan by 1966 under the Clean Water Act. It was called block management money. The solution to pollution in the old days was great quantities of dilution. Go read the bathroom in Butte, Montana in 1965 and what it said on the wall is flushed twice. It's a long way to Lake Ponderay, which was 300 miles downstream. Go read the toilet outfall in Great Falls, Montana in 1960. Flushed twice. It's a long way to New Orleans. Because there was no treatment of sewage. There was no treatment of anything. So what came out of the 60s was this huge concept of we need to do planning for a number of things. We then passed the National Forest Management Act. We fed, passed the Federal Land Planning Policy Management Act and about 10 other federal laws that require planning. So every national forest has a comprehensive plan. Every BLM office has an RMP, which is a resource management plan. Every Bureau of Rec office has a water irrigation, diversion structure, whatever plan. The Department of the Army has plans. The US Fish and Wildlife Service has plans. 
Everybody has a plan. And the beauty of the equation is that's fine, and all of you hate participating in that process. One, it takes some time, and everybody's excuse is I don't have any. Well, damn it, either show up or else don't bitch. That's my sentiment. I read the 80-page opinion out of Livingston, Montana by the judge over free-roaming buffalo on 72,000 acres out of the park. And I hate to say it, <clears throat> the judge was right probably in what he wrote. The tragedy is everybody bitching about it didn't show up for the game in 2005. Because if you read Montana's comprehensive fish and wildlife conservation strategy, the strategy for buffalo in Montana is to establish free-roaming herds of bison outside Yellowstone National Park. It's been the policy for eight years. Why bitch, stock growers? You didn't talk in 2005. It's your fault. Don't yell at the judge. Don't yell at fish and game. There was a game, and you know showed. Two counties, two county attorneys, and one town showed and commented on that 2005 plan. Out of 56 counties in the state, 56 sets of counties' attorneys, and 241 towns. There was a ball game. Nobody brought a team. Simple deal. So part one is flip the page besides what a plan is and who has it. What matters to all of you a lot starts on the fourth page. It says Appendix 1. You see there's these sections that say things like, this is halfway down the page, it says 43 CFR section 1601. It says, in addition to public involvement, the Bureau of Land Management is obligated to coordinate its planning processes with land use plans of local government. Let me read you that all again. It doesn't say the BLM might be obligated to do that. The BLM could do that if they have a good hair day. Every hair day is a bad hair day for me. Anyway, the BLM could maybe try. It's possible they'll do it. No, the law says the BLM is obligated to coordinate its planning process with land use plans of local government. Go to the next paragraph. In providing guidance to BLM personnel, to personnel the BLM state director shall assure such guidance is as consistent as possible with existing officially adopted and approved resource related plans, policies, or programs of other state agencies, Indian tribes, and local governments that may be affected. The federal policy has to be as consistent as possible with the local policy as long as, quote, the local government has one. So I asked the woman in the back who's from the weed district desk to come because what nobody told you is your weed district is a local government. So if you have a weed management plan for your jurisdiction, whatever that jurisdiction is, I don't care if it's five acres, 5,000 acres, 50 million acres, I don't care. If there's BLM land that's planned inside your district, that law says they need to consult with, coordinate with you, and they need to be as consistent as possible with your plan. We're not even invited to the RMP planning process. We're not even at that table. You'd be invited except you never showed up for the game. So the BLM's rules now, courtesy of two counties in Montana in 2005, say the BLM shall. And I'll read you that language in a while. So it ain't optional for them to not get you anymore. So the first thing is this. If you have a rural fire district, which is local government, its fire plan is the document that the Forest Service, the BLM, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Reclamation, the Corps of Engineers should look at in respect to its fire management plan on its land. So that part of local government called a fire department, fire district, has authority in its district to have a plan. And if you do it, you not only have a seat at the table, you not only have them have to coordinate with you, they also have to sit down and make theirs consistent. Next of all, the BLM is obligated to take all practical measures to resolve conflicts between federal and land use plans of local government. They're under an obligation under the federal law 
to resolve those conflicts. Not we felt like it, not we're not going to because we don't like Fred, we don't like Mary, we don't like Joe, not we're not going to because we hate cows, we hate grain farmers, we hate sheep, it doesn't matter. The law says is obligated to take all practical measures, period. It ain't optional. That's the problem. So when you can look down and say, now wait a second, the National Environmental Policy Act says, frankly, that preserving custom, culture, heritage, and natural aspects of our national heritage are important. And NEPA also says, we want to attain the widest risk of beneficial, widest range of beneficial uses of the environment without degradation. If the county's plan talks about how you do that and says this is important to our custom, our economic development, our sustainability, what goes into it, suddenly the federal plan has to consider, be consistent with, and work with your program. This is not an optional deal for the Fed. So if you look at the next page, <coughs> there's some requirements they have. All federal agencies shall prepare an EIS, which is an environmental impact statement, or a NEPA document for every recommendation or report and proposal for legislation or other major federal action significantly affecting the quality of the human environment. Now, that did not say of the natural environment. That says of the human environment. If you got a 300 cow permit and you can't run a ranch without 300 permits or without 200 and they cut it to 100, guess what? That's a major EIS required because they are now affecting significantly the viability of your human environment. But we never bothered to show up for the game. Okay, using that way you just said never bothered to show up for the game. Uh, our county, they just got done doing, a, or our area, they just done a BLM. RMP, then. RMP, they just are in the process of finishing, or still in the process of, I'm not sure. How late in the game can the local agency show up and say, here's our plan, and still be effective in that? Any day. The best way you do it is when they start doing it is you show up the first day, but if they've done it so far and you haven't showed up, your county commissioners, your local government, your whatever that did that plan needs to go to the director's office of that planning area and say, look, we have a plan, we weren't invited, we were supposed to be, you should talk to your lawyers and billings about the fact that you have a really nice document called a desk guide to cooperating agency relationships. For what it's worth, this is the BLM's document. I'll tell you who wrote half the language in that thing, two private lawyers in Montana for 11 counties. The BLM copied it. The irony of the story is this, the first lawsuit of their lawyer in federal court was also my first lawsuit in federal court in 1984. And the lawsuit is still going today. 29 years later, all of the parties except one are dead and both lawyers are still alive. <laughs> Confederated Salish Kootenai Tribes versus Montana DNRC, Water Resources Division versus Pope, Ciotti, Starner, and Fleming. And everyone but Frank Pope is dead. The tribe lives on. They're in a compact right now. The DNRC is still there. And 29 years later, we ain't done. And we're not going to be done. But it works. So at any point they have a plan, they should show up. But it gets better. Go ahead. What about expertise? You have tremendous special expertise. No, Jeff Johnson, you are not a rancher. You are a professional land manager. Micah Humphreys, you are not a botanist. You're not an agroeconomist. You're a professional land manager. Tony, you're going to be a professional land manager. That's specialized expertise. I will, the only reason I ask is because right now there's a bill going through the land legislation that granted conservation district special expertise. The same thing went through last year, granted county commissioner special expertise, just to give them more standing at the table. What, I mean, so is it automatically there? It's automatically there anyway because in respect to custom, culture, heritage, and history, and local tradition, local custom, who has the knowledge of local custom? Not a bureaucrat in the District of Columbia, not the regional office in Denver, who knows local custom, local culture, local heritage, and local history is local, period. It's you. 
The problem is we didn't show up. For 30 years, we have not done it. And I don't mean to be so passionate about it, but it's a big deal. I have a damn good education. I bucked a lot of bales, moved a lot of pipe, rode a lot of horses, broke a lot of teams to get it. And you know what? It's a great toolbox. The point is you have a toolbox. So what I tried to get you together is a list of the things you need to open up the toolbox and go to work. It's one thing to say take apart an engine, which is what most people say to you. I'm not saying take apart an engine. I'm saying here's a toolbox. These are sockets. These are screwdrivers. This is a torque wrench. This is a cutting torch. Go to work. Because you know more about your local custom, your local heritage, your local history than I do. You grew up here. Your parents grew up here. Your grandparents grew up here, probably. Your great aunts, your great uncles, your friends, your cousins, everybody. That's it. So, each EPA document shall include, among other things, alternatives to the proposed action. The alternatives usually have a preferred course of action, but they are required by law to have alternatives. Now, local government, if you want to know how much power you have, look at the next paragraph. 42 U.S. Code 4332 is the second paragraph of the National Environmental Policy Act. It says, copies of comments by state or local governments must accompany the EIS or E8 throughout the entire review process. If your county steps up and comments, that goes through the whole process. If your weed district steps up and comments, your conservation district, whoever, it goes through the whole process. Jeff, that RMP, we submitted comments. We went to their little dog and pony shows that they Good. did. Good. And they were very limiting on who was allowed to go to that. And we were supposed to have been represented by another entity, and we wanted to go to the table. And they shut they shut us out. Well, the problem and is do those documents that we submitted are in none of the documentation that they have from public comments. Then they broke the law across the board. So who their office director is is the, the Office of the Field Solicitor in Billings. And I don't know if Karen Dunnigan will, but I know John Chafin in that office would tell him, you guys screwed up, let's go back and do it again. Here's the tragedy. By not doing it, this is the favorite trick of the greenies. Not to be politically incorrect, but the favorite trick of the greenies why we lose all the lawsuits is nobody painted by the damn numbers. Look at a picture painting with the little numbered boxes. It says paint ones first, paint twos, paint threes, paint fours. You know what happened? When they locked you out of the room, they painted number seven. They didn't do anything with three, four, five, and six, and they have to do it. And what their lawyers hate is when somebody calls them up or your special counsel for the state who does the work for all the weed districts or your county attorney calls the field office in Billings and says, look, they locked us out. At that point in time, the party is over. And BLM is going to go back, do the whole thing again, or figure out how to remedy the problem. It ain't optional. It's a procedural process issue. I'll get you there in a minute. But you're dead on for what you've been through was just flat not right. Each document shall also include a discussion of possible conflicts between the proposed federal action and local land use plans. Let me read you that sentence again. Each NEPA document shall include a discussion of possible conflicts between the proposed federal action and local land use plans. So if you have a weed plan, there has to be a discussion of how their RMP conflicts with yours. If your county has weeds and its county growth policy, its county comprehensive plan, there has to be a discussion of how their RMP conflicts with your plan. And if they didn't include it, guess what? You have to tell them you have a plan and we are here. That's your obligation, the same with the Forest Service. So this is like go to the basketball game and tell the other team, by the way, we're here, we're going to play. At that point in time, they're on notice and you have the right to do it all. So here is the BLM's Give that one up for a second. I'll go back to it. But here's what they said. Their mission is to sustain health and diversity, to serve with honesty and integrity, to improve, to cultivate community-based conservation, to respect value, and support our employees, and whatever else. But their cooperative agency training says, 
Their objective is to encourage all and as many participants as process as possible in local government. That is their manual, their handbook, and they did it. Get a copy from the BLM and walk into your local director's office and say, this is what our district thinks, this is what our county thinks, and you didn't do it, and we told you, and you guys better read this, and you better call us back. Because for the first time, what agriculture gets to do is you get to hand a bo whole bunch of people their head the way the Western Watersheds did, the way Defenders of Wildlife did, the way Nature Conservancy, the way whoever did for years. There's a ball game. You just haven't been in it because you didn't show up. Federal agencies shall cooperate to the fullest extent possible to reduce duplication with state and local requirements. Cooperation shall include joint planning, joint environmental research, joint hearings, joint environmental assessments. That is 40 CFR section 1506. Federal agencies shall, not might, not could if we feel like it. Well, maybe we will if our hair is okay today. We didn't have burned eggs for breakfast. No, federal agencies shall cooperate to the fullest extent possible. When they kicked you out of the room, was that the fullest extent possible? Not no, I'd say hell no. Don't just go to the window and throw it openly on and say I'm mad as hell, I'm not gonna take it anymore, which is what people do. That doesn't win the day. What wins the day is a letter that says this is the rules, this is our understanding, we have a plan, we tried and you wouldn't let us play and we wanna do it again because you can't remedy it otherwise. That changes the whole complexion of the game. As well, environmental impact statements must, not may, not could, not might, must discuss any inconsistency of a proposed plan with any approved state or local plan and laws. Where inconsistencies exist, the EIS should describe the extent to which the agency would reconcile the proposed action to the plan or law. So if they're inconsistent with yours, they don't only have to identify it, they have to discuss it, they have to say how we're gonna remedy that. <clears throat> this is not made up. This is the code of federal regulations. This is the damn rules whereby they do it. Just nobody ever bothered to tell local government, this is how we play ball, folks. As well, they also define mitigation. And this is the most powerful tool I have ever found. Mitigation includes avoiding the impact altogether. Lock your damn buffalo back up in the park. So that's simple enough. That's avoiding the action altogether. Two, give me a 375 H&H &H magnum and about 400 shells and I'll solve the problem for you. That's not a good option. B, limiting the degree of the impact. Only let 50 buffalo go, don't let 500. What's the degree going to be? Limit how much? That's a mitigation measure. Don't cut your cow herd all the way to zero on the BLM allotment. Cut it to 50 instead of zero from 70. For sage hens, which is coming, cut it from 100 to 80 or 100 to 50 or 100 to 20 instead of 100 to zero. That's my tragedy of the year. I had to replace two cows last year that died on sage hens bones in their throat that choked them and killed them because they were eating sage chickens and the bones got them. Predation. <laughs> Predation by cows, yes! It was so dumb. That's local custom and culture. I'm the only guy who knows that cows eat sage hens, right? <laughs> Jeez, talk about ridiculous. Anyway, yeah, besides, what do we do then to repair, rehabilitate, or restore the affected environment? How do we restore, how do we rehabilitate, how do we repair? And who knows better how to do that? Local government, local weed district, local conservation district, local fire department, local hospital board, local whatever. D, reducing the impact by preservation opportunities or compensating for the impact by replacing or providing substitute resources or environments. You wanna close my grazing permit? Fine, where the hell are you gonna give me a grazing permit? Boy, does it get quiet. Wait a second. The mitigation step says compensating for the impact by replacing or providing substitute resources or environment. Not compensating by paying me money. Compensating for the impact by replacing or providing substitute resources or environments. 
That's a huge shift. Local government, because of concerns for environment, wildlife, socioeconomic impacts, tax base, has standing to sue federal agents and seek relief for violations of NEPA. You do have standing. The problem is this, if you're damn good at this, you're not a lawyer who has anybody in court. Nobody knows you ever did it. Get it done, get local government to do it, massage it through, and for God's sakes, don't tell the other side you got it done. If you're good, that's what you do. If your local government that's good, you don't advertise it and say, we're gonna kick everybody's butt. No, you quietly show up, you have the plan, you have the custom, the culture, the heritage, the numbers, the history, you have the wheat plan, you have the conservation district plan, you have the grazing plan, you have the economic stuff for your county, the BLM, the Forest Service, whoever gets it, and when you're done, guess what? You got most of what you want. You only might get out with 80% of what you wanted. Fine, if you get 80%, more power to you. I frankly think if you get out with 50 or 60%, you're doing damn well. Because what we've gotten traditionally is this percent. Because we weren't there. That's a huge difference in the way the equation works. So flip the page. The last time I read you this page, I read it to your Senator Barassa in a Senate hearing in Washington, D.C. Recognizing that arrangements under which the federal government cooperates through conservation districts with other local units of government and land users have effectively aided in the protection and improvement of the nation's basic resources. It is declared to be the policy of the United States. This is not a joke. It is the policy of the United States that these arrangements and similar cooperative arrangements should be utilized to the fullest extent possible. Every federal agency, Forest Service, BLM, Bureau of Rent, Fish and Wildlife Service, I don't care. It is the policy of the U.S. to do that. When the BLM didn't do it, they breached the terms of the Soil and Water Conservation Act of 1968. In the implementation of that act, the Secretary of Ag shall utilize information and data available from other federal, state, and local governments. Who has the best knowledge of your economy? You do. So who's got the database that ought to drive the federal plan? Local government. There it sits. The secretary shall, in addition to appropriate coordination with other interested agencies, okay, includes local agencies, utilize the services of local, county, and state soil conservation committees. There's your districts, all of them. Congress finds solutions to chronic erosion related problems should be designed to address the local, social, economic, environmental, and other conditions unique to the area involved to ensure that the goals and policy of the federal government are effectively integrated with the concerns of the local community. It doesn't say that the goals and policy of the federal government are implemented over your head and to hell with what you think. No are implemented effectively and integrated with the concerns of the local community. There is a ball game. And we know how to play. The green side does not have knowledge of local, does not have data on local. Here's the news. Go to Western Montana. Here's two numbers that I'll give you that are phenomenal. Go to Lima, Montana. You'll find there's 93 households in town 78 heat with wood only as their primary source of heat all winter. And the average income of the town of Lima citizens is $6,100 below the federal poverty line. Shutting off wood from Forest Service ground makes sense? No, but I love discrimination based on income. Write me a bigger check in the next lawsuit, please. On top of that, the wolf deal. Ask anybody in the rural communities in Wyoming that were affected worse in western Montana. Go to Alberton, DeBorgia, Tura, Superior, Lima, Melrose, Glen, Wisdom. You'll find all the little places. Hunting season is one eighth of the year in Montana. Five weeks of rifle season, two weeks of other. Care to guess what percentage of their annual income comes in that one eighth of the year? The average is 59 to 63 percent. In one-eighth of the year, we make damn near two-thirds of our income. Do lots of wolves, don't have a good season, get rid of the elk. What's it do to the economy of local communities? 
Who bothered to tell the BLM or the Forest Service that? How many cows were on the forest permits in Sublette County in 1970? How many in 1980? How many in 1990? How many in 2000? How many in 2010? You can get the numbers. You've got them. It's just somebody needs to show up with the damn numbers and say, we're local government, we want to preserve our economy and everything else, and this is why it matters. Because this is the base for the whole gig, and there we sit. The local unit of government is encouraged to seek information from and the cooperation of agencies of the Department of Agriculture and other federal agencies. So not only do we say they have to, local government is encouraged to seek that cooperation. That, by the way, is not 16 USC, it's 42 USC, 42, 34, 32, which is also part of the National Environmental Policy Act. The purpose of this title is to encourage and improve the capability of state and local units of government and local nonprofits in rural areas to plan, develop, and carry out programs for resource conservation and development. Resource conservation and development includes having an economy which is viable, an economy that matters, and there it goes. So there's a game, and I have a raft of other statutes on the question, but that's kind of a simple summary. So here's some things. Question one, find me a definition of agriculture. Find me a federal law that defines it. Find me a state law in Wyoming that defines it. Find me a county ordinance that defines it. You don't have one. What is agriculture? This was an assignment to 48 law students in 2006 who were told, you have five weeks, I want you back in five weeks with a definition of agriculture for me, look through everything, and if you don't have it at that time, I'll give you one more week to get it right, and if you don't get it right, I'll lower all your grades one grade, and I about had a riot. They came back at the first break and they said agriculture is the practice, process, procedure, and science of raising food, fiber, or other materials for use by society. And my response was, you lose. You're partway there, there's a fifth one, and you've got four, and you've got one week, guys. What's the other word? All of you know it, this is your life. This is your history, this is your heritage, this is your culture, what is the other word? It is the practice, process, procedure, science, and art. Spinning a rope is an art. Pulling a calf is an art. Farming a field is an art. Setting a dam in a ditch is an art. Breaking a horse is an art. All of it's an art. It's not just a science. It's not just a practice. It's not a process. It's not a procedure. It's also an art. That is our history, that is our custom, that is our heritage, that is our national tradition, that is agriculture. So the first thing that the counties did that did this in Montana is a right to farm ordinance. Montana has a state law that says counties can do a right to farm ordinance that says agriculture is not a nuisance, it's not a problem. And that big joke about that is what's the number one wine in western Wyoming and Jackson Hole? You guys think it's 10 spoon meat? What's the number one wine in Jackson Hole, Wyoming? You guys think it's 10 spoon mead? Is it Franzia Johannesburg Riesling? No, it's not. It's Keith Hughes trailed his cows up the county road and they pooped and it's on the bottom of my BMW. <laughs> That's the number one wine in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Just like it's the number one wine in Big Fork, Montana. So what right to farm says is agriculture is important, agriculture matters, this is what it is, and we are not a nuisance, and we are committed to keep it. It's a significant part of our world, it's a significant part of the rest, and it defines the importance of custom, culture, history, and heritage. That's what matters. So if you look back in the package I gave you, there's an appendix G, and it's titled, Due Process the Elements of Fair Play. That is the most basic good guideline of what the rules of how you do land stuff are. What is due process? It means you get notice of what the government is doing, how it's going to do it. Two, besides notice, you get an opportunity to be heard. 
So what you've already said to me is you got whacked on two things constitutionally already. Your district didn't get notice of what was going to happen, and your district also got told, don't show up, you can't be heard. They're unconstitutional and illegal in the statute, period. Thirdly, you also have a right to cross-examine if it's an adjudicative hearing. For example, if the agency's revoking a permit, revoking a water right, that's an adjudication deal. You can ask questions. Fourthly, there needs to be disclosure of everything that was talked about. All the information, every comment that came from everyone, you get to hear. The law also says local government comments have to go through the entire process the whole way through. If you make the comment, there they sit, and if they're not in the EIS, the game is over. There needs to be a set of findings of fact. How do we do what we did? How do we get there? Why do we do it? And there can't be a conflict of interest or a demonstration of impropriety. So if the person who's the BLM field office director also happens to be the president of the United States chapter or the Friends of the Wild Wolves, does that on its face appear to be a conflict of interest? By the same token, if the person at the BLM is the head of the Wyoming stock growers and wants more cows on ground, does that look to be a conflict of interest? You bet. So this is a two-edged sword. You can't write a plan that says our plan is to take all the grayling and blow them all up. No, our plan is to get down all the trees. No, you need to be consistently good, scientific, local, figure it out, and you need to avoid an appearance of some other agenda. No conflict of interest, no sense of impropriety. There needs to be some guideline for how prompt a decision will be. What's the schedule for the whole thing, for example? When is the RMP going to come out? And records of what the whole proceeding involved, where it sat, and there's probably some ground rules for how the thing goes down. That is the best article as a summary for how the process works that I've ever read in 35 years of doing this. It's written by the head land use lawyer for a huge law firm in Washington, D.C. in 1972. And he gave me a letter that said, Walla, you can use it wherever. And I've used it for 35 years. And it's great. As well, to set the high bar, two counties in Montana adopted that article as part of their comprehensive plan. Not just to say, we're going to set the high bar for ourselves. If I'm going to bitch at the BLM and say they're not playing by the rules, I'm saying we have a high bar and you're bound to it too. Sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. But National Park Service has the same requirements on it. It's not just BLM. It's just nobody ever showed up and told them. The federal law says you're encouraged to get them to do it. And you are. They just never said, show up. Well, damn it, guess what? You can. It's just you need a toolbox that says, do it. So here's your second little exercise. It's a simple one. So we did an outline. <coughs> that was done by a friend of mine who did this process the first time ever, and he is the best at this I've ever seen. Jeff knows him. It's Rob Van Deeren who lives at Dillon, Montana. He's a farm kid who lives north of town, and he's as good as you'll find anywhere. So the name of the article is suggested on how to comment effectively. How do you do this? And there's some simple guidelines. Don't make up stuff. Don't make up facts. Don't make up information. The first rule they teach you in law school is your client will always lie to you. <laughs> Why does that always work? And second, your client will never ever tell you the whole story. So we have what's called the party language. And the party language is when somebody comes up and says, you know, I've got this friend who's got this friend who's got this cousin who's got this girl pregnant. What would you suggest that he does? <laughs> Why don't you just tell me you've got your girlfriend knocked up? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> but no, it's always the mystery party question. So don't play the mystery party question game. Talk about what it is, where it is. Don't misquote or use a quote out of context from another article. Don't insult people. If you write in your comments on a federal plan that so-and-so is a jackass, it'll be there through the whole deal, and that will come and haunt you. It will always bite you, every time. It's a public document. It's a public deal. There it goes. So don't do it. And remember, Montana and Wyoming are nothing more than a small town with a really long main street. And they are. I don't know nearly as many lawyers in Wyoming as I do in Montana, but I know enough of them. 
So I can call around, they'll call around Montana, talk to the guys know and say, what's the deal, White Wally, send us this, whatever. They'll ask, that's how it works. That's a small town that just happens to be the fourth and ninth biggest states. But it is. So don't write stuff down that's not appropriate because it will bite you every time. Never do it. Do develop a working relationship with the staff. So don't walk into the BLM office and say, look, you are a boob because you didn't let us do this, whatever else. It's better to walk in and say, look, we have a problem. We were trying to pay ball. And we've got a copy of your desk copy guide of agency relationships and how we do this as one government to another. And I'd really like to read this with you because it seems like we didn't quite do this and we have a problem and I'd like to solve it before people get really upset. Period. Oh, and by the way, do you want the fact that you didn't want this on your resume when you finish your career with the BLM in Busby, Montana? At the end of a 55 mile long gravel road? <laughs> Sorry. No, don't go there yet. But what you need to do is remember you've got to have a working relationship. And remind me to tell you a thing about that that we learned. Don't be surreal. Don't be ridiculous. Don't do anything that's not just sort of detached, scientific, and observation. The reason I can tell you what percentage of houses in Lima heat with wood is that's the testimony in the National Congressional Hearing on the last wilderness bill. A lot of people do not understand why I said this is the best compromise I've seen in 30 years, except if you're going to do it, I need these five changes. And I gave him the text. And Barassa from Wyoming got all of them, and he was good. His staff was not quite as plugged into the concept of the fact that the Soil and Water Conservation Act says there's these requirements. But he listened. He got it. So if you're going to talk about it, scientific viewpoint, what the reasons are, it's easy to say 78 houses heat with wood out of 92. That's a fact. You're going to have a wilderness area? Fine. Let's take wood out of it with teams of horses. I don't care if it's a crosscut saw. Let's do it. That's what we've got to get done. There it goes. Review the agency's assumptions and conclusions for accuracy and reasonableness. Besides the fact you can't lie, don't believe they won't. I had three of the BLM's lawyers and five other people with the agency lie to me about a trial over a roadway in eastern Montana. And the landowner lied. And what we finally found out is the landowner called in every favor he could to beat up the lawyers working on about what bad guys we were. And guess what? He'd made a deal beforehand with American Wildlands to trade this ranch for another ranch if he could close the county road through the middle of the ranch because it was targeted for the first herd of free roaming buffalo in Montana. Took me a year to find the file. Took me a year to find the paper. And you know what? All the guys who stood up at a meeting and beat me up have not spoken to me since and won't look me in the eye. And I have the papers and I mailed them to them and said, look guys, you kind of made a mistake. Why don't you just apologize? And they haven't. It. It's a small town. And you know what? It'll be a cold day in hell before they have any credible testimony in any hearing anywhere in Montana. Because they lied and we proved it. And I'm a ruthless bastard about that because, frankly, if your word's no good, you're no good. It's that simple. I'm tired of the greenies lying to me. I'm tired of the agencies lying to me. And don't do it. It's that simple. So when you flip the page, all of you are a qualified professional. And I wasn't picking on you, Jeff, when I said you are a qualified professional land manager. And you are. You know more about your springs. You know more about your grass. You know where the weeds are. You know all of it. The BLM, the Forest Service, the state DNRC, nobody knows it like you do. Mike, with what you go do a test plot on or take 10 students to do, they're the qualified professional. They're a professional land manager. The Weed District is all 10 supervisors or six professional land managers. That's what you are. So you have credibility. So when it says be a qualified professional, you are. When you send the letter in, it says, look, I've been here for 40 years on this place. My grandfather was here before that. My dad did it. I talked to my uncle. I've been here 10 years. I talked to three former owners. However you do it, you know and they don't. And knowledge is power. And if you have it, the other side can't refute it. Because you have what they can't overturn. Sometimes be independent. Sometimes be eccentric. Somebody called me arcane in a meeting about two weeks ago because they don't run a computer, and I am, and that's okay. But other times, be part of the herd. 
So some days be part of the herd, sometimes don't be part of the herd. Understand the agency criteria and process. Understand how they're doing it, what they go through, and where it sits. This is paint by the others, numbers. So then it says provide the information, the agency's criterion, and this is a really good guideline about how to do it. And you'll notice when you get to page four, it says do process the elements of fair play. So the very article I gave you already is incorporated as part of how to come in effectively because that process is critical to the whole deal. How do we play fair? That means the football team that's playing six-man ball doesn't get nine people on the field. That means the basketball team with five people on the field doesn't get to have eight. It's five. There it goes. So play fair. Your grade school team doesn't get to have four seniors in high school on the team. So once you know the rules, everybody will play by the rules. People are less prone to play by the rules if they assume you don't know. And that's part of the problem, is you haven't shown up, and you didn't take the time, and there it sits. That's a hard deal. So here's your classic case in point, and then we're going to go to work with Tony for a minute, so people can get a copy of this. This is Montana's Comprehensive Fish and Wildlife Strategy document. And here's the letter that came out October 22nd, 2008, from Fish and Game to all the counties in Montana. And the document that it's talking about, and I have a copy, but it's not with me here, says, this is our 2005 summary of Montana's Comprehensive Fish and Wildlife Conservation Strategy. The printing budget for the plan was $371,000. Not the budget to make it, the printing budget. It's a beautiful document. Then when you turn the page, there's a copy of the table of comments that says community types, of greatest conservation need in Montana. So look at this page. And I don't want anybody to grab their chest and fall down when I read you this. Community type of greatest conservation need, grassland complexes, 31,551,627 acres, or 33.53% of the state of Montana. Grassland complexes, 31 million plus acres, are identified in need of conservation. That's a third of our state. Who bothered to comment? Who showed up for the game? Who bothered to talk about it? Nobody. And fishing game got away with it. I understand. Thank you much. Call if you guys have questions on that. Thank Definitely. You. She has to go back to level. She's with the weed district. But I didn't mean to pick on her because she is local government. She has the standing. Then you go through the rest of their list. Mountain streams in greatest need of conservation, 59,364 miles. Turn the page. Mountain streams in Montana. Cool deal. When you look at the page in mountain streams, what you'll find, when you flip the page over one more, mountain streams, total 59,364 miles. We have a total of 59,364 miles of streams in Montana that are mountain. And how many miles need conservation? 59,364. Every damn mile of mountain waterway in Montana. The game is over. Prairie streams. Next category. 91,189 stream miles in Montana in greatest need of conservation. Flip over two pages. <laughs> How many miles of that type of stream are in Montana? We didn't get that cage copied. But guess what? It's the same thing. All 91,189 stream miles. Every stream mile in Montana is in greatest need of conservation. <clears throat> Gig's over, guys. It's done. That was the 2005 policy. They gave notice in 2008. They published the document. And not only did they identify habitats, they identified animals in greatest need of conservation, including bison. In the bison plan, for conservation, the strategies was to have free roaming herds of buffalo in other places of Montana to function ecologically to restore grasslands. One third of the state's grassland area, one third of the whole damn state needs conservation and the tool to do it with identified in the plan is free roaming buffalo. Guys want a joke? Do an 80 page opinion out of Livingston, Montana, spend 40,000 bucks on lawyers to sue. My question is where the hell were you in 2005 and 2008? Because the plan's been there now for 10 years almost. But we didn't show up for the game. 
there was a ball game, but we didn't want to bring a team. It was too much trouble. It was a big pain in the neck. So here's the first best thing you can do, and I want to thank Tony for agreeing to do this. In terms of local custom, local heritage, local history, and if you read the federal laws, there's a number of things they talk about. You can consider economic development, economic sustainability. The Forest Service, for example, is obligated to consider and provide for community stability in its decision-making processes. Let me read that again so you make sure you heard what I said. And I'm not crazy. This is the law. It's just hard to believe it. The Forest Service is obligated to consider and provide for community stability in its decision-making process. Community stability is defined as a combination of local custom, culture, and economic preservation. That is 30, 36 CFR 221 and 36 CFR section 219. So the way we get to what's local custom, culture, and economic preservation is Tony's exercise. So what you have on top of you is a map of Johnson's Place, which is about how far from Dillon? Seven miles north, but they also have grass that's about 10 or 12 miles, miles south at Peters, and I don't know what else, but there's stuff all over the place. So who knows the most about that history, that custom, that economic heritage, that preservation, and that history? This man and his kids and other relatives. So what I said, and I asked Mike, I said, get me a student, get me a map, and tell me what's there. I want to know where the water sources are, where the roads were, what's deeded, what's leased, what's BLM, what's state, what's federal, what's whatever. And that's what falls to these people, because he knows the Western Watersheds does not, Bureau of Rec does not, BLM does not. Tony knows, or he can talk to his uncle, his cousin, his neighbor, his neighbor's dad, his whoever, and they'll draw it. So where are your roads, Tony? Where's the old cabins? Are there any? Well, this is the main road here. And then this is Highway 91. Okay. Um, we've got another road that goes along this canal here. And that, that road has a legal easement for anybody that needs, like any of the ditch riders that need to follow the okay. canal. So it's not a public road. It's a limited road for purposes to maintaining a canal, though. Yes. So it's for a ditch, canal, water course, whatever you want to call it. So it is there. Go ahead. Okay. And then this is a road that, that uh, we own part of this road. However, we don't use it. The neighbor uses it. Um, and then I guess there's a lot of other roads, but they're not any main ones you can see. Like there's a road all the way out here to, like for each pivot point. Um, there's, we have a, So we have a pond here. Is it a natural pond, a non-natural pond? It's a man-made pond. Yep. So is it a natural drainage that feeds it, or is it a water course, like a ditch or something? Uh, there's a natural slough right here. Perfect. That feeds the pond. Okay. So what you just got is the repair <coughs> area. You got the pond. You got the structures made by people to maintain it. Do fish and wildlife use it? Yes. Do you guys shoot ducks on it in the fall? Um, no, but there's a lot of geese on it and the geese nest in it. We only shoot geese. <laughs> they nest. We like goslings. They're so much more tender. <laughs> or did you say that really? Don't repeat that, please. <laughs> so, are there any old cabins or any old homesteads on the site? No. This okay. Now, what do we have here? There, there's um, something there. I just can't see what it is. I think it's just a ditch, right? That's got a little more irrigation than this. Because this... You can see the pivot circle goes like this. Got it, okay. And so this is just a drier corner. That's a ditch, that's a ditch over. Okay. So what we've done is you've identified the riparian, which is one of the huge targets for the green side, et cetera. You've identified the ditches, the canals, the waterways, the roads. It's a small enough piece there, there's not enough history, but this is the next piece, which gets even harder. Now that's explain really what this is right here. Uh, okay, that would be... I'm going the wrong way, probably. I was going nope. the right way. That's so first trout tell us crick. what that is. This is Trout Creek. Um, okay. We don't lease anything here, but I think these are man-made irrigation ponds right there. Okay. Then what is this one here? Let's 
Oh, this is McKesser and this is Trapper. Okay. okay. So we've got the streams identified. Can you identify the ownership um, of who has generally. them potentially? Okay. And how do you get access to them? Uh, through a road along here. And how do you cross the creek? Um, just board it. Okay. So I think the creek crossing is in here somewhere. And then we go up here and the cabin would be here. Is that an antique historic homestead or something? Yeah. Cool. And then there's another cabin right here. Is that also an old homestead? Yep. It's on a water course. How'd they get there? Um, I think it would have been, what do you think, like through here? Yeah. And then the state piece is right here, right? This way? Go this way. No, the other way. Down? Go up, I guess. I tell you, go up. Here. Yeah. Okay. Right there. there. Okay. okay. And then on the state piece, you can still see, isn't the schoolhouse right here? Yes. Just the foundation of an old schoolhouse. Which schoolhouse is, is that? Good. Guess what? You have the school records probably to 1920 or 30 when they closed it. They're available. They're in the county courthouse probably. And that is our custom, our history, our heritage, and our national value of agriculture. And what we did, all those roads Tony gave us are roads that people want to close, no access, don't drive across country. Guess what? People have been doing it since the patent was done 100 years ago or 80 years ago. We need the access. Our cows need the Ford. We need the Ford. How do you do fire protection over here if you get a fire, Tony? <laughs> Hope for the best. <laughs> Besides that, how do you do it? How does the fire truck get there if that starts to burn down? Well, you can see there's, this is a road, isn't it? I, I don't think I've ever been on it. Yeah, this, and you see you Ford the Crick there. Sure. So the Ford's important for fire protection, fire management. The road's important. There it goes. And it's part of the management plan for state DNRC, which is Montana State Lands Office, Forest Service, BLM, Fish and Wildlife. Those things all matter. So who knows where they are on the ground is the person who's out there doing it and his dad, who doesn't know where the agencies, who doesn't think about it. And the protocol for the Forest Service and the state should be the minute there's a forest fire, call the permit holders. Call the guys who lease it, call the allotment holders, because they know where the roads are and they'll get your truck there, period. That's how it works. That should be the protocol and the value of those roads, the value of those fords, those values of those access is not just value for agriculture. We are not alone in this deal. This is a we deal. This is the value for hikers who break a leg who need an ambulance. This is the value for fire protection. This is a value for weed control from an idiot who dropped the weeds off his four-wheeler, whatever else. There's a ton of reasons why you keep it. So what they've got is this. And what we did at the counties is we said, look, I want the map. I want them on acid-free paper and acid-free ink because they'll last 100 plus years. There is a record. So sign them, date them, say who you were, give me your birth date if you're over 70 or 80. And the biggest part's this. You're well, how old this year? 20? I'll be 21 next week. 21, so we can drink in Wyoming. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but besides that, 21, find me somebody who's alive who can draw those roads on this map in 1940. That memory is invaluable. No one has it but you. So once Tony does it this way, or Jeff and Tony do this, find two guys who are alive who are 75 years old in your community who may have gone to that school Map it out, write it down, and guess what? There's what the federal law says we're supposed to have, and it's the best tool you have to preserve what we've got now. The cows have been there forever. So when a guy's 70 years old and you say, did you have cows there? The answer will almost always be yes. Did you have a dairy cow too? Yes, we milked every day. Did you go in and out of your house in a wagon or in a Model T or whatever? Yes, we did. The tragedy is the institutional memory is dying. Finding a guy who's 80 years old who can remember is hard. And 80 years old, if you can remember at 10, takes you back only 70 years. That's 1940. So this is not a sense of I'm saying not only can you show up at the game, the problem is 
you're losing the toolbox for the game. Knowledge is power, and if you don't preserve it now, picture it, acid-free paper, acid-free ink, draw on the maps, sign it, and date it. The memory is gone. Who had it, who did it, is history. It's no longer history because nobody knows about it. Nobody remembered it. Nobody can talk about it. So what you're doing, Tony, is a perfect exercise and preserve it. And here's the gig. I take all my pictures with real film. I make people do it. And I don't run a computer camera because I'm computer illiterate. The real truth is this. I can't Photoshop silver nitrate. Evelyn Cameron took all the pictures in central Montana from 1889 to 1927. They were all on glass slides placed in a basement and the state of Montana is printing them four per year right now. Look at the side of every cow, look at the hip of every horse, look at the drovers, look at everybody else, there the pictures are and they can't be photoshopped. What is in them is how it is. Your family pictures are invaluable. The aerial photographs of the place in 1937 are invaluable. The map Tony just made if he was 70 today, is invaluable. Because if he has a stroke tomorrow, there ain't going to be one time. Mm. That's the problem. So I don't mean to put you on the spot and have you do it, but it's interesting that at 20 years old, it's even hard for Tony to remember which is which, what's where, what was what, I haven't been on it enough, so he's asking his dad, and thank God Jeff's here to help too. But if he doesn't know either what was what, find the person who graduated in the school. So part of this exercise is not just the exercise of, do it. Find it out. It is our history. It is our culture. It is our custom. It is our art. We are agriculture. And we haven't shown up. And we damn well better, because if we don't, there isn't going to be any us left pretty soon. Maybe the last guy raising cows will turn out the light. Some days I feel like that's what's going on with it. Thank you. That is yep. great. So that's what matters. Here's the good news. That is now a whole lot easier than it was before. Because five years ago, I couldn't have called Micah and said, do you have somebody who can do this with us or whatever else? This came so, straight from the NRCS. Yeah, but Micah got the pictures from NRCS. He did them on the internet, whatever. Change the printer, change the ink, make it acid-free, acid-free, and you can preserve it for a long time. There it goes. Those pictures that people have the negatives of or the photographs, take the pictures. Sign them, date them, say who's what, what you were doing, what year. There's probably pictures of that school somewhere in Dillon, maybe in the museum or whatever else. But if they are, save them. Because the road's on the picture ahead of it, and if somebody wants to close your road, guess what? It's a 70-year-old road. We use it all the time now. They used it for the last 80 years. And NEPA says we preserve all aspects of our national heritage, our custom, our culture, and our history. You want to really upset some people who are very green? Use that tool against them. They do not have that tool. You do. You are the custom. You are the culture. You are the history. You are the heritage. So the tragedy of the fish and wildlife conservation strategy is that's an amazing tool that got through the system with nobody commenting. To say that 5.34% of Montana, this mixed shrub and grassland, has to be preserved now and is in great need of conservation is really tough. 33% of the grassland complexes in the state have to be preserved. That's tough. Those rules affect everything. Do you guys want to see how this is going to play out when the sage chicken stuff comes out at the end of this year? Do we want to think about what that means to the sage hen deal? This is a complicated process in the sense of those guys have been playing the ball game for a long time and we are sitting on our butt and we're losing. So here's the biggest tragedy of all and my instructions are to say this to you and I had two people tell me, Wally, you make sure you do that. So here's the deal. Beaverhead and Madison County pulled it off first ahead of any counties in the country to get it done. You tried it in Wyoming with the Jack Morrow Hills project and it fell on its face because people got out of it, which is down by Laramie in that country. They tried it in California. They tried it with two projects in New Mexico and Arizona and they were not about planning how do we deal with the Fed. They were old land grant arguments about Mexico gave us these land grants. That's our stuff, not the BLMs. Guys, there was a treaty, get it right. So here's the tragedy. When Beaverhead and Madison County quit having a resource use committee that did this and didn't ask the people back. 
What they then did is they pitched out their plan, and they also pitched out all the maps, all the signed copies, and all the records. Because we didn't keep playing ball. We, the people, have government by participation. And when we quit participating, the guys in office don't know better, doesn't pay them any more money, so they just pitched it in the garbage. So the problem is the resource use plan that is now the template for four western states, two Canadian provinces, and God knows how many counties, is no longer the plan of those counties. And it worked. The Forest Service plan and the BLM plan both went through the process without a derailment. The problem was we didn't show up subsequently there too, and we should have kept doing it. So that what I'm supposed to tell all of you is this. If you have a run at doing it, it's fabulous, and you should. And I've given you part of what you need to do it. Here's the other bigger part of the tragedy. Look at Beef Magazine last week. What it says is this. We really need to be worried about EPA regulations, etc. What we don't have is a farm bill. You do now. It just passed the other day after this came out. But what it says simply is this. There's two biggies. One is the CWA, which is the Clean Water Act guidance, and the other is the dust rule from agriculture. And what the Clean Water Act guidance says is this. It would change the federal definition of navigable waters, which would put all surface water under the jurisdiction of the Environmental Protection Agency and the Corps of Engineers. It hits everybody out there with water on their property, which means if you have any body of water, it affects how you use the water or the land around the body of water. We are talking about creeks, streams, brooks, dry streams, ephemeral streams, arroyos, playa lakes, in-ground stock tanks, and even potentially to the point that if you just have low points that fill with water now and then, those would be considered waters of the United States and regulated. So when I asked Tony, tell me what this is, is it a ditch, what's where, how does the pond work, is it a ditch filled pond, it's natural. The reason I was asking those particular questions too, is if that goes through the way they think it's going to go through, you see that, what that does to Johnson's place. All those ditches, all those draws, all those arroyos, all those little bits of wetland potentially that really aren't wetland get affected. So when there's a wetlands plan by the BLM, a wetlands plan by the Forest Service, a wetlands plan by the Fish and Wildlife Service, if you have a local plan, a local weed district, a local conservation district, a local grazing district, a local irrigation district that has a plan for its stuff, their plan has to be consistent if you show up with your plan. Suddenly, before that is the law, you have changed the whole playing field. You're not riding the bus. For the first time in 30 years, what agriculture gets to do is drive the bus. That's a novel concept, isn't it, Tim? It's a whole different mindset. Instead of riding the bus, you have a chance to drive the bus. And I kid you not, when we told Micah, title it very simply this, if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu. And for 30 years, we've been on the menu, and we haven't been on the table. So if you have a question on any of it, ask. If you want a copy of some of the other federal rules, I brought them. Here's the last part I was talking to you about. The BLM has no duty to make its plan consistent with the local government plan if the local government does not notify the BLM of the existence of its plan. So if local government doesn't show up, the BLM's out of it. They don't have to be consistent if you didn't tell them. What Go is ahead. the timeline on that notification? For example, the big Horn Basin is doing an RMP or there's a process up. Did the local governments need to be in there before they would start the RMP? In the middle it's, of the game? You can do it in the middle or you can do it at the end. Here's the way it works. If you can do it at the beginning, sorry, I don't know how to do that, but I do know how to do this. So here's the gig. The first part of the process is scoping, which is identify the problem, talk it through, figure out what we've got, what the agency's going to do. 
So the best time to show up is when we're looking at starting scoping. Now, they're probably through a lot of the scoping process now. If they are, fine, but if they're not done, you're entitled to a seat at that table. Once we do scoping, we do drafting, which also means we're going to talk about alternatives. We're also going to talk about mitigation. So they then have to start including all that stuff. So if you didn't show up here, at least say, look what we've got. We have a plan. We're here now. Let's bring it on and let's get going with the process. Here is the weirdest thing Rob Van Duren and I learned, and you shouldn't probably say a lot about it, but I've said it elsewhere, so you should hear it. What we never thought would happen in this process is this. There was a huge schism within the agencies of who has an agenda, and if you say the wrong thing, you're not going to get promoted. If you say the wrong thing, you're not going to get promoted. If you say the wrong thing, you're not going to get promoted. So what happened is some people higher up, an office supervisor, a district director, or whatever, were telling their people, don't put that in the plan, don't put that in the plan, don't put that in the plan. So what started happening about six weeks in this process is that person would say, Rob, when we're done today at noon, let's go have lunch. Guess what happened? Those people started giving our county people what they knew should be in the plan that was the way it was, whatever else, so we got to sandbag the crap out of it. Because who was feeding us stuff were the agency people who were told, you can't do this. Because it doesn't fit somebody else's agenda. So what happened by being there was they didn't get themselves in trouble. They didn't get themselves upside down. But because we were credible enough, and we were honest enough, and we had no agenda to hurt anybody, what happened is the agency started giving us the stuff that needed to be in the plan which was an incredible eye-opening experience for me because I never ever thought we'd find ourselves in that position. And you've probably never heard that part of it before. But a lot of what happened with the BLM process is we put the things in there, especially for timber harvest, grazing, water management, um, wild and scenic rivers that came from the agency's people itself who were told by the agency, don't put this in the record, but we did it anyway. So they didn't have to jeopardize themselves Local government became the tool whereby they did it right. They did it appropriately. And that was a huge benefit that we never counted on. I never, ever thought that would happen. That was totally unanticipated, but it worked fabulously. It's working now in two other states in the West exactly the same way. So the reality of the deal, I suspect, is the greener the District of Columbia is, or the non-greener the District of Columbia is, Whoever's agenda is there drives downhill to all the people. And this is not about an agenda. This is about knowledge is power, play by the rules, make the right plan, consider the alternatives, plug it in. And what we call it is the Reagan years. The early 80s were very simple. Earth first, we'll clear cut the rest of the planets later. There was a total resource mess there versus the other side, which became the end of the Clinton era, which is Earth first, we'll totally cease doing anything in the environment on the rest of the planets later. So they were as far to the right and as far to the left as you could get. And the reality is, this is maybe where you need to be, but the cold, cool facts, facts are, the economic stability of your community is in large part agriculture. So if you have, if Vex have 100 AUMs of grass on a BLM permit and they're gonna cut it to 50, that affects the community a lot. If Johnson's have 200 units on BLM and they cut you to 150, that 50 helps you, hurts you a lot. That's our local economy. That's our local stability. That's our local schools. That's a local market, our local feed mill, our local tractors, our local irrigation system. Go through the system. So you have a tremendous asset of knowledge that nobody else has got. You just need to build the record and use it. Because you, exactly, and your point's dead right. 
That's why when you look at due process, the elements of fair play, look right there. It says build a record. There's got to be a decision record. There's got to be a whole rationale, a whole set of reasons behind it. That's what you do. So if he didn't build the record then, the problem later is there's no way to do it. The other part is, if my neighbor Bernard Harkness talks about it, great. He's 88, he has Alzheimer's now, but he's really sharp about what was there 70 years ago. That's grand. The problem is, if I don't get it written down, get put in the record now when he's dead in six months or two years, I have no record. I have no chance to put it in the record because I have nobody who knows. So not only is it like person the age of your dad or yourself, that other generation, one more extended backwards, is invaluable. That's what really matters. Granville Stewart, 1886, said it better than anybody I've ever heard. And I didn't hear him, but I've read it twice. You have no idea where you're going unless you have a good understanding about where you've been. I don't know where I've been 70 years ago but those guys do. And they'll help me a lot with where I'm going if I just get it from them. The brand on the side of all those cattle and all those horses in Evelyn Cameron's picture, I'll tell you about tomorrow. Only a person with an education from Oxford, who was a Scotsman from Edinburgh, who ran the biggest ranch in America and Canada, would understand that you made your brand something that talked about what you owned. And only that education would understand that Roman numeral X is 10, and what that ranch owned in one contiguous block was 10 entire townships in Texas. And the brand was XIT. And it's still there. That is our custom. That is our history. That is our culture. That is our national heritage. And that will tell you why I talk about the Drover Road tomorrow afternoon, because we are the Drover Road. Thank you much.